guys, it's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we talking about today? Today we are going to talk about a very well-known event, very highly publicized event, and that is the 2013 El Reno, Oklahoma tornado. In addition to some of the facts that we're about to read off, this tornado was pretty high profile because this is the first time that we've seen veteran storm chasers uh, get killed or injured. That's right. There was a Weather Channel crew that was filming live at the time and they got caught up in it as well. So people were seeing live what was happening to them, which just made it all the more devastating because you're actually there with them seeing all this. This was definitely a very sobering event for those of us who do go out and chase and enjoy chasing that it's not all as safe as we might think it to be. And this is something that going forward, a lot of chasers started paying more attention to when forecasting and getting close to tornadoes. What has come to be called the El Reno tornado happened just 11 days after a record-breaking EF5 tornado devastated the Oklahoma City metro area on May 20th. The National Weather Service forecast office in Norman, Oklahoma, measured the damage path to be as wide as 2.6 miles or 4.2 kilometers with up to a mile more due to downdraft straight line winds making this tornado the widest tornado on record. The El Reno tornado was part of a large weather system that dropped tornadoes from Oklahoma to Indiana. So there's a brief overview of the event itself. We will get into the synoptic details and the specific storm that caused the El Reno tornado. But before we get started, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss another Meteorology Monday or a case study. Now let's get into the synoptic setup for the event. Much like the events of May 19th and 20th of 2013, a potent set of ingredients came together during the afternoon hours on May 31st for a major severe weather episode over central Oklahoma. A nearly stationary front was draped from southwest to northeast through central Oklahoma with a dry line mixing eastward into portions of west central and southwest Oklahoma by mid-afternoon. The front strengthened with time in western Oklahoma, where surface temperatures rose into the upper 30 degrees C range behind the dry line. By 2100 UTC, the winds ahead of the front had backed to south-southeasterly and then southeasterly. During the heat of the day, extreme instability developed ahead of the dry line and south of the frontal boundary placing Oklahoma City in a very volatile severe weather environment. By 2130 UTC, or 4.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time, anvils began to emanate from the cumulonimbus clouds in western Oklahoma. By 4.45 p.m. Central Daylight Time, a broken line of convective storms had extended up to the north-northeast along the front, while new, smaller cells had begun to form to the south near the dry line. By 5 p.m. Central Daylight Time, a line of convective towers appeared along the front, northeast of the previously existing storms. About this time, Rack's pole was deployed just north of El Reno, where the broken line of convection along the front was clearly visible, as were the more widely scattered storms along the dry line to the south. Rack's pole, so what is Rack's pole? Rack's pole is a rapid X-band polar metric radar. Basically, this is a Doppler on wheels. If you're familiar with the show Storm Chasers, this is kind of a smaller version of that. It does scans really quickly and it's lighter than a regular Dow, so you can get closer to an event and get away from it faster. This is operated by the University of Oklahoma's Advanced Radar Research Center, which is out in Norman, Oklahoma. And they do a lot of this type of research, bringing radars out into the field and getting storms like the El Reno tornado. So just like you were talking about in the Storm Chasers episodes, how they had the Doppler on wheels, technology continues to improve and research facilities take their prototypes to go out into the field and do more testing and improve algorithms and then turn those improvements back into operations, which improves forecasting. And that's just a great cycle of just improving the technology and the forecasting and the warnings. Between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., the nearly stationary front began to move southward as a cold front, and storms erupted near the dry line cold front intersection. These storms quickly became severe with strong mid-level rotation. Soundings from the Norman National Weather Service showed Cape values greater than 3,000 joules per kilogram, with over 5,000 joules per kilogram measured 
in a localized area just to the south-southwest of El Reno. Though the 0 to 6 kilometer vertical shear was only 25 to 30 meters per second, combined with cape, abundant moisture, and a 0 to 3 kilometer storm relative helicity of 400 meters squared per second squared, the atmosphere's ingredients were in place to support the development of tornadic supercells. The first tornado touched down at 5.35 p.m. Central Daylight Time in Kingfisher County and produced little to no damage. The second tornado to form, labeled the El Reno Tornado, would go on to be one of the most powerful tornadoes ever sampled by mobile radar. This storm would go on to produce several other tornadoes in the Oklahoma City metro area and heavy rainfall that in turn caused historic flash flooding. So there you have the general synoptic overview of what was going on. And you can kind of say mesoscale because we kind of drilled yeah. more down into the Oklahoma region. But let's go ahead and actually look at the specific storm itself. We touched upon it briefly in the synopsis, but now let's focus on the actual storm itself. At 6.03 p.m. Central Daylight Time, an unusually wide and very intense tornado formed in a supercell in central Oklahoma. This tornado took a complex path rapidly changing in both speed and direction. The tornado developed roughly eight miles west-southwest of El Reno, Oklahoma. Initially, the tornado moved to the southeast at 20 to 25 miles per hour. At 6.09 p.m., the tornado turned to the east, just south of Reno Road between Heston and Branley Roads. The tornado continued to expand in size just southwest of the El Reno Municipal Air Park, where its speed increased to 30 to 40 miles per hour. As the tornado passed just south of the airport, two satellite tornadoes formed briefly on the west side of the tornado. At 6.19 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the tornado crossed U.S. Highway 81 as it continued to expand in size. There, the tornado abruptly turned to the north while also accelerating to greater than 50 miles per hour. From 6.24 to 6.26 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the tornado reached its maximum in size and intensity near the intersection of Radio and Reuters Roads. The tornado, still very large, slowed down as it approached U.S. Interstate Highway 40. From 627 to 635 p.m., the tornado made a loop just north of the interstate while decelerating to less than 10 miles per hour. During this time, a rare anticyclonic tornado was seen on radar beside the much larger and stronger main cyclonic tornado. It formed along the rear flank gust front, which was marked by swirls in the reflectivity image. After 6.35 p.m., the tornado moved east once again and dissipated at 6.42 p.m. near the intersection of I-40 and Banner Road. Eight people were killed in the tornado, all in vehicles. This included three severe storm researchers who were killed east of U.S. Highway 81 as the tornado overtook their position. Additionally, several other people were killed while attempting to escape the tornado near U.S. Highway 81. Finally, two people were killed along I-40 while waiting for the storm to pass. This tornado was well sampled by two separate mobile radar research teams, the University of Oklahoma's Raxpole Radar and the Center for Severe Weather Research's Doppler on Wheels. Both radars captured high temporal and spatial resolution data relatively close to the large tornado. Both radars measured winds in the tornado of more than 200 miles per hour. The Raxpole radar data shows winds of at least 295 miles per hour up to 302 miles per hour, very close to the surface. These intense winds were present in very small sub-vortices within the larger tornado circulation. An analysis of the high-resolution radar data combined with the results of the ground damage survey indicates that none of these intense sub-vortices impacted any structures in rural Canadian County. So despite the measured wind speeds, surveyors could not find any damage that would support a rating higher than EF3 based solely on the damage indicators used with the EF scale. In total, the El Reno tornado caused eight direct fatalities and injured 151 more. The storm subsequently produced flash flooding in the Oklahoma City metropolitan area, resulting in 13 additional deaths. Of the 31 confirmed tornadoes that touched down on May 31st, the El Reno tornado received the highest rating at EF3. It had a record-breaking width of 2.6 miles, 4.2 kilometers, and was on the ground for 16.2 miles, 26.1 kilometers. So there's the specifics of the storm itself and the tornado itself. There's a lot to digest there. 
there's a lot of points yeah. that we just went over. That's right. So we've got a few things we need to discuss. Yeah. Number one, how the tornado moved along the ground and how it didn't take a traditional path. Right. How it accelerated, decelerated, changed directions, caught storm chasers off guard. Other things with this tornado, how wide it was, the maximum wind speed. And then not only that, but it got an overall EF3 rating because yep. of the damage that it caused and how the EF scale works. So there's there's a lot we need to... A lot, lot to talk about a here. A lot to talk about here. So let's go ahead and, and talk about the first thing and that is, is its behavior in terms of its rapid growth, expansion, wind speed, acceleration, uh, and then movement. So that yep. is not really typical that tornadoes yeah. do what it does especially to grow right. that size that speed accelerate decelerate and then change it's usually they, they don't do that <laughs> yeah maybe small tornadoes ef zeros ef ones ef twos maybe because right. they can be influenced a little bit more they're a lot smaller so it's much easier to influence the path of something that you know is an eighth of a mile wide compared to something that's literally 2.6 miles wide, the dynamics and stuff that must have been in place to move that much and you've got the, the forward speed, the speed that it's spinning at, not to mention sub vortices and actually an anticyclonic tornado right next to it. Yeah. There was a lot going on with this tornado that led to it hanging a right when they didn't think it was going to and unfortunately when a tornado is going in a certain direction for a long time, you kind of get comfortable with the fact that the tornado is going to head in that direction, so you can get pretty close to it with roads there. And unfortunately for the Twist X team, Tim Samaris, his son Paul, and Carl Young, along with a lot of other chasers that day, they just weren't prepared for the tornado to make that abrupt turn. That's right, and even very experienced tornado chasers like the Twist X team, storms like this can catch you off guard. One other point I do want to add, and that is, is that what we've learned about and heard from storm chasers being impacted by the storms and there's deaths and there's injuries shouldn't deter us from storm chasing and being afraid. Uh, it should just be more of a, we have to be aware when we go storm chasing. Yeah. And even the most seasonal professional out there can run into storms that behave erratically and they can get stuck in a situation that can be deadly. So we just have to be mindful that when we chase, we have to be careful and do our best to stay out of harm's way. Now, if you remember from a couple weeks ago, we just did a video on the EF scale and how it is a damage scale rather than a wind speed scale. Let's talk about that for a second. This tornado got a rating of EF3, which as you can see from what we just read, this tornado should not be rated an EF3. It was an extremely devastating event, very destructive, the widest on record, measurements from radar up to 302 miles per hour. I mean, this thing is obviously, when you're thinking about it, an EF5 tornado. However, one of the failings of the EF scale is that it's a damage scale, and if a tornado is an EF5 and it doesn't go over any property and it doesn't damage anything, it's not going to get that rating. That's right, and we did discuss those limitations, and we'll have to see where the meteorology community goes from here with yeah. these kinds of storms and how to improve on the EF scale, the enhanced, enhanced Fujita scale. <laughs> <laughs> there might be an enhanced, enhanced Fujita scale that has something to do with wind speeds. But That's right. again, that, that goes back to it's hard to measure wind speeds if you're not putting a radar right next to a tornado. It's one of those things where it'd be nice if it was a wind speed scale, but at the same time, how are we gonna measure it? If we're not always having radars right next to these things, we got really lucky with the El Reno tornado that there were so many radars right around it and we were able to see this and also pick up on the anticyclonic tornadoes and the sub vortices and everything. But in most tornadoes, you're not going to get that because there's not going to be radars right next to it. So this brings up the question, how many tornadoes in the past with lower ratings were actually fours or fives? It's something that we'll probably not know. That's right, because you can't go back right. and redo it. Um, you can't put a radar in can't <laughs> next to a tornado that already happened. That's right. Yeah, it's just, again, the improvement in technology, the improvement in getting teams out there, mm -hmm. finding ways to be able to measure wind speeds and include that in the EF scale. You know, time will tell, and we'll Difficult see what science. the new research is going gonna, is gonna to show us and where we go from there. 
One last little fact about this tornado is that it pretty much missed the entire OKC metro area, which led to much lower damage costs. We talked about this tornado happening 11 days after the Moore tornado, which had one of the highest damage costs on, on record, but this one pretty much missed anything other than a couple farms. So the cost for this one was in the low millions compared to the billions just a week and a half before. And if you missed our case study on the 2013 Moore, Oklahoma tornado, it'll pop up in one of these corners here and go check that out after you're done with this one. So there you have it, the 2013 El Reno, Oklahoma tornado. Again, if you liked what you saw, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss the next one. Follow us over on our social media, Facebook and Instagram popping up here, as well as checking out our website and the links for everything that helped us put together our synopsis, all the papers and SPC and the National Weather Service pages will be linked down below if you guys are interested in checking that out for yourselves. Also down there, you'll find the School of Weather courses if you're interested in learning about the basics of meteorology. Go check out those courses as well. Until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday. Of the May 31st. Hey, I wrote it down. You were supposed, <laughs> okay. to, proof you were supposed to proofread it. <laughs>